Hello and welcome to this Australian Biocommons webinar. My name is Melissa Burke and I'm the Australian Biocommons Training and Communications Officer and I'll also be your host for today. In these webinars, we aim to share useful information about the latest digital techniques, data and tools available to the life sciences community. Each month we hear from our national and international peers on a bioinformatics topic that we hope will help you achieve your best environmental agricultural agricultural or medical research. You can keep up to date with the latest news and events from Australian Biocommons through the channels that you can see on your screen. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. In my case, this is the Turrbal and Yuggera people of Mianjin. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural spirit and spiritual connections to country and recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. At the Biocommons, we want to make it easy for life scientists to get the most from their data and perform reproducible research. We do this by providing access to platforms, tools and workflows such as that in Galaxy Australia. Galaxy Australia is an open web-based platform for computational research, and it's part of an international community-driven effort to make it easy for life scientists to reproducibly analyze their data with cutting edge methods. Galaxy Australia is run by QCIF and Melbourne Bioinformatics and is underpinned by computational resources provided by the University of Melbourne, QCIF and Arnet. We're really excited to have Dr. Gareth Price, the Head of Computational Biology at QCIF Bioinformatics, and Dr. Johan Gustafsson, the Australian Biocommons Bioinformatics Engagement Officer, joining us today. They're here to share their experiences and insights into using Galaxy Australia to recreate bioinformatics methods and workflows. Welcome to the webinar, Gareth and Johan, and I will now hand it over to you to tell us all about workflows and how you can use them in Galaxy. Yes, thank you, Melissa. Um, it's my privilege to kick this session off, and then Johan and I are going to toggle slide decks and uh, some live demos throughout the session. So thank you, everyone. Um, Melissa's kindly set up the title, so let's jump right in, which is about recreating and creating bioinformatics methods and workflows within Galaxy Australia. So we are going to just assume some knowledge about Galaxy Australia. More, um, please do post questions at the end if you'd like to understand more about how to use Galaxy. Uh, we'll be showing it live shortly. So Galaxy Australia is one of a number of global services, but behind it is Galaxy Project, and that is an open web-based platform for accessible, reproducible, and transparent computational research. And I hope uh, as we go through today, we will really be able to prove to you the accessibility, reproducibility, and transparency of doing your research on Galaxy with particular reference to uh, workflows. So uh, I know we have participants from Australia and overseas and that this being recorded we expect a, an audience a broader audience after that as well so let's put Galaxy Australia into context so it really is a, a world of galaxies uh, Galaxy Maine uh, hosted out of North America the Galaxy Europe hosted out of Germany Galaxy Australia as Melissa said hosted out of a number of organizations uh, here in Australia and we uh, the three large instances of Galaxy and go by the naming convention use galaxy.star, star referring to our country of origin. But behind those main galaxies are many other public galaxies and, and current count is over 160 other publicly available galaxies, many of which are domain specific. So they're either about a particular species or a particular style of analysis or a particular community of practice. But you can discover all these and we'll show you the uh, community hub at the end of this presentation. Within Australia, this Gal Galaxy Australia, pardon me, we have well over one and a half thousand individual tools uh, installed on the service that can be run individually 
or as the theme of today is, into a workflow for running collectively. Behind Galaxy Australia, and a clear take-home message from today is there is the Galaxy Toolshed, which has over 8,000, it's 8,690 odd available tools, which can be installed on a Galaxy service. So one of the messages from myself today as a product owner of Galaxy Australia is please, if you find there is a missing link in your analysis that you can do on Galaxy Australia, to the tool shed. If that tool exists, then we'll install it for you on our Australian instance. Workflows, we're talking about workflows. So uh, Galaxy Australia has over 61,000 invocations of workflows that have been built by our users. Uh, inside those workflows and as individual tools, we've run just shy of 5 million jobs on our service in the last few years of operation. And uh, we offer a minimum uh, 600 gig of storage for every Australian researcher that comes to use the service. And I, I emphasize minimum there. If you need more, uh, we have a, a process to uh, allocate you more resource because we want you to be able to do the maximum amount of analyses you need to to further your research. Uh, and our users, which we'll show you in a sec, have. Uh, host or our service hosts over 11 million uh, data sets for our users. Those users are over 20,000 uh, Australian and uh, by extension international collaborators of our Australian researchers that use the service. With that uh, grounding in the platform, I am going to throw over to Johan to talk about workflows and we'll come back for some live demos after Johan has spoken. Thank you very much, Johan. I will unshare and give the talk to you. Okay, um, thanks, Gareth. Um, I wanted to start um, by saying that workflows are important. Uh, this is a somewhat obvious statement, but the power of creating a workflow is something that shouldn't be understated. Um, so the example provided on this slide here uh, is one for Hi-Fi genome assembly. Uh, and this workflow not only encapsulates the assembly part, um, but it also has steps included to convert file formats to be suitable for downstream workflows. So it encapsulates the power of a workflow in that it strings together tools that you need to complete your analysis. A workflow like this supports reproducibility. Uh, it can reduce duplication of effort across multiple groups of researchers, allow you to capture key provenance information about your research, um, and ultimately let you spend more of your time on developing new methods and the interpretation of your results. Workflows will, will even help you when you need to repeat specific analyses multiple times. And there's definitely an element there of improving your efficiency and reducing your frustration. Community numbers support um, workflows as an artifact that um, has a definitive impact on research. There are more than 300 workflow languages currently available. There are some that are more popular than others, but the sheer number um, is extraordinary. Um, and if you look at community maintained workflows for one of the most popular workflow languages, Nextflow, um, some of these workflows have reached hundreds of thousands um, of clones. Workflows also exist in significant numbers. Uh, so the international workflow registries already contain community contributions and each one is um, growing. In the context of Galaxy, the main EU instance has more than 700 publicly available workflows at the moment. And our local Galaxy Australia already lists more than 300. Clearly there are numerous workflows and used at the right time, they can add significantly to a research project. But you might still ask, why should I create a workflow? Um, and this is because workflows can be complex. They can be complex to both build and understand. Um, 
they're also time consuming to build. Um, and consequently, this means that they're also, also can be maintenance heavy. They can also be difficult to find, difficult to redeploy and basically reuse. Um, and they're often replicated um, by many. Some of these challenges can be resolved by making workflows findable, reusable, and citable. And this is largely the role of registries and community efforts like Galaxy and like Nextflow Core. Um, and others can be addressed by systems that make workflows straightforward to construct, compute agnostic, and user friendly. And Galaxy is, an, is one example of such a system. Back to the question, why should I create a workflow? Um, creating a workflow in Galaxy is a relatively short-term investment in intellect. And as I mentioned earlier, this, re this will result in a long-term gain of reproducibility. And if you couple this with the use of registries and workflow publication, you can also achieve long-term gains in visibility and citation. The key is that Galaxy makes many of these workflow requirements or challenges more manageable. Um, so when you first open the canvas shown on this slide for creating a new workflow in Galaxy, you have the ability to create complex fit for purpose workflows. Um, you can access guidance on best practice. You can join and learn from many existing Galaxy communities. And a key message is that you can actually do this today, right? So the platform is there, the service is there to use. The catch is that going from idea to action to successful workflow isn't necessarily intuitive. Um, so there are many options in Galaxy, including the selection of tools, individual tool settings, ways in which you can build workflows, whether you want to do this for single files, for collections. Um, and like I mentioned, there are also best practices that you should follow. All of these are available on Galaxy, but it might not be immediately clear where these feature are features are and how you might use them. Um, and demonstrating the capabilities of a platform is better than just listing them, right? Which is why we're here today. Um, this webinar aims to onboard you to workflow construction in Galaxy. Um, hopefully it will give you a sense of what Galaxy can do um, and how you might best leverage um, those capabilities. Uh, so first things first, how do I get started? So option one um, is likely to be trying to find a workflow to reuse. And this is simply because you don't want to waste your valuable time building a workflow if another researcher has already built an equivalent one. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if you'd like to directly search the registries, there are two key international options available. The first one is DocStore, and the second is Workflow Hub. Um, the Australian Biocommons has a presence on both, um, but for the moment, um, the workflows from Biocommons and our partners are registered on Workflow Hub. Uh, here, I'll also mention that if you do build Galaxy workflows and you want to share them via a registry, uh, Australian researchers are welcome to join the Biocommons space um, on Workflow Hub. Um, and the purple link on this slide leads you to a guide on the steps required to get started. You can also visit Workflow Finder, uh, which provides a simple tabular interface listing all the workflows that the Biocommons and um, our partners have registered on Workflow Hub. And finally, the most direct option is to access the content of these registries via Galaxy. Um, so using the um, import function of Galaxy, you can choose your registry, so Workflow Hub or DocStore. Um, you can search the key terms, and once you've found the workflow you're looking for, you can then import the specific version that you're after. Um, and so here I'm pointing to the latest version of the um, genome assembly workflow I showed earlier. The second option, if you can't find a suitable workflow to reuse or even one to adapt, to your specific use case uh, is to create a workflow. Um, there are three ways to build workflows um, in Galaxy. The first is to build one de novo. Um, and so here, you're simply adding tools sequentially using the Galaxy workflow canvas um, that I showed earlier. Um, 
And this is a graphical way of building, building your workflows. Um, the second is from a galaxy history. So here you would use a set of tools sequentially for your, for your analysis. And you then use that analysis history to create, curate and finalize um, a work, workflow file. The third is from a publication. This is potentially the most involved, um, but it's also potentially the most valuable. And here you may need to either find or request um, a set of tools that are described by a publication and then use the de novo workflow build approach to recreate that workflow um, and test it. Um, the analogies here are that you're either painting the Sistine Chapel from scratch, repainting the Sistine Chapel from previous experience, or painting the Sistine Chapel based on someone else painting an equivalent chapel. So uh, I'll now hand over to Gareth, um, who's gonna provide some live demos of these um, different workflow construction options. Yes, thank you, Johan. All right, so um, Johan set us up very nice. Appreciate that to um, dive straight into Galaxy and show you how we might achieve some of these tasks. Um, I am going to go in reverse order uh, for the way they were presented. So we're going to attempt to do one from a publication first. Then I'll show you uh, how to extract workflow from a history. And finally, a, a brief look at manipulating that workflow canvas uh, blank and how you might add tools to it. So uh, under the vein of here's one we prepared earlier, uh, here is our publication of choice that we are going to reference the genome assembly of the numbat, uh, a marsupial in Australia. And this paper has come out of an Australian research group that we know well and work with. So uh, just for the benefit of this audience and the benefit of my eyes, I'm just going to zoom right in on the publication. So uh, thankfully, this publication, uh, as we would hope for many, and there's a picture of the numbat, has a well-described med section, in particular, a well-described method section for the workflow we are going to try and replicate, which is the transcriptome assembly. Uh, we're not going to emphasize the annotation aspect of the workflow. Uh, the logic behind this, and I'll show you during Galaxy, is a workflow can, uh, as Johan mentioned, and uh, be complex. And by virtue of that, it can have, uh, I guess, baggage associated with it, and it can become a bit of a behemoth. Uh, what we're doing here strategically today is we're extracting out the assembly. We're going to run an assembly workflow. We could then later extract out the annotation and run an annotation workflow and then link those two workflows together symbolically in Galaxy as sub workflows inside a mega workflow. Uh, this is, it's borderline semantics, but the idea here is that we are building, so, uh, yep, we are building modular workflows to allow us to really capture a large piece of work. All right, so uh, let's jump into Galaxy. Um, and we will get to Greg, your question later. It's an excellent question. So uh, orientation in Galaxy, uh, like I said, we're not going to go through the, we are focusing on the workflow section today. I myself have a number of workflows already in my uh, user profile. We're creating a new one right now. And you're going to see this uh, after the demos, but one of the things we're going to emphasize is uh, the, I guess we talked about the accessibility, reproducibility elements of Galaxy. There's actually, uh, again, we're talking about a, an investment upfront that pays off long term. There's actually no reason why I couldn't um, name this transcript. Sorry, I'm inspired by genome assembly. And I could go further and grab the DOI for this publication. 
so that when I return to this workflow in Galaxy time and time again, I have already inbuilt for myself that buffer of where did I find this? Um, can I go find it again? So we have arrived at our bank canvas. A couple of orientations, if you really are new to workflows in Galaxy, the mechanistic bits we'll talk about in a minute. The workflow name is there. You'll note on the right hand side of my screen is a workflow version. This is fantastic. You can iterate your workflow up, you can run it, you can scale it back to a previous version if you need to, and the annotation is propagated across. Later, we will talk about licenses, creators, and tags. So let's have a better look at that publication. And just apologies as I quickly scroll down the screen. I am going to. Uh, I guess show you my methodology, uh, crude or functional as it is. So raw RNA sequence data was trimmed for quality and length using Trimomatic under the following conditions. So first of all, the tool is cited. Uh, I don't need to copy and paste this. I am just for uh, prudence here, but we could search for this tool in Galaxy Australia. Oops, can't hit. there it is there. Here is the Trimomatic book inside Galaxy Australia, and it's been loaded into my uh, workflow. Now, there's a couple of things. Uh, it needs something on the left-hand side as input, and it's going to produce something on the right-hand side, an output, which is a fast queue file. I am not, for the sake of this webinar, going to go through and detail the trimming settings, the clipping settings, the sliding window, et cetera, in Trimomatic, but I'll show you how to do that. What I do note in the language, however, on the screen here is that this is paired end -width, and this is something I need to factor into my workflow. So, in the workflow canvas, the tool is a box on the screen. The right-hand side of the screen is now the configurable tool menu with the subtle but very relevant fact that what I set in here sets the settings for that tool for the workflow. And this is this investment in intellect that pays off. Now think carefully about my tool once and execute it many times. So the first practical consideration is I have, I need paired in data as replicated in the paper. And you'll see what happens is the tool dynamically changes. It now recognizes that because it's paired in, I need two pieces of data, each the first and second of the pair. And it will also produce me now a variety of outputs associated with that paired data. I could, as I said, go through the publication for example, sliding window uh, was four and five, uh, sorry, over here, it was the 20 and 10 or 13 and 10. I could go through here, there is four, sorry, average quality five. I could set things now, but I'm not going to laboriously go through each tool. I can then keep scanning the text, all the little pop-ups there and, um, come down to the second paragraph where it tells me that the trimmed reads de novo are assembled from particular organs using a tool called Trinity with default parameters and read normalization. So I now need to go find a tool called Trinity. Now there are a number of tools in Galaxy that are uh, reference the Trinity tool, but here is the Trinity tool on the left-hand side of my screen at the bottom, a de novo assembly for RNA-seq data. Well, that sounds about right because that's exactly what we're attempting to do. So you can see it's just populated into the middle of my screen. So I'm just moving things around on the screen. This is nothing but cosmetic and is very much open to your own personal interpretation of how close or far away you like things on the screen. Now Trinity has come in. And you'll see that it also is expecting, pardon me, single end reads. Uh, it can take a consensus, but it doesn't have to. So again, I need to just specify that this particular tool today we will be using in a paired end fashion. And no surprise, the tool changes. 
So the real beauty of Galaxy, and we're going to tease this out uh, in the next few minutes as well, is uh, piping of data. And um, this is not a comparison between a GUI interface like Galaxy and a command line. Both pipe data equally well from one tool to another. But I do like the Galaxy uh, of doing it. So I am going to direct a Trinity output, which is my high quality reads from the forward of the pair. And I am going to direct them into Trinity. And all I'm doing by that is taking this uh, noodle and extending it. And uh, I've got three available positions on the screen and I've now linked those up. And that's a symbolic link to say, please send the results of the Trinity, in, uh, sorry, Trimomatic to Trinity. If, for example, I made that as a mistake, I linked it to the right-hand side, you could just see there, I can hold the Twitter, de-link that symbolic link. So there is my forward, there is my reverse. And now those two tools are forever linked until I choose to do otherwise. The rest of the paragraph describes Trinity and the annotation, the functional annotation using um, transdecoder and some blast searches at NCBI and uh, Hammer or Hammer. However, we are going to skip down. So we're just, this bit here, as I said in my prelude, this could be abstracted away as another workflow, an annotation workflow, but we are showing you the transcriptome assembly workflow. So we're going to start at this particular sentence here. To determine the proportion of reads presented, trim reads were mapped back to the assembly using Bowtie 2. So here's our next tool, Bowtie 2. So I'm going to go searching for Bowtie 2. Going to search for bow tie and see what comes up. There it is at the top, bow tie two. It's come into the middle of my screen. I've got a couple of things. I could either move these tools, I could zoom out, what gets easier for my personal interpretation of the screen. Now, bow tie two uh, is giving me only one potential input, a collection of reads. Now it's doing this uh, because this particular tool uh, is expecting me to configure a built-in genome and Galaxy Australia hosts many hundreds of genomes uh, pre-configured for tools. In this particular case, default, default is for single end reads for a built-in genome and the first genome on the list, the baboon genome. We do not, in this particular case, wish to map our numbat reads or any other reads we might have uh, hard-coded to the baboon genome. So we're going to specify a genome from our history and build index. And you can see this allows us to get another box. Where are we getting our genome from? Let's pop back to the paper. Determine the proportion of reads represented. Trimmed reads, so this is post trimomatic, were mapped back to global assembly using bow type two. So, what that says is the Trinity result, the fast A's here, are treated as a reference file, and the trimomatic reads are mapped to here. Now, I am going to do my forward reads. You can see incidentally that my reference read, I'm not allowed to map there because it tells me that that conditional has already been met. And that pop-up box won't go away. Here's my forward reads. Now my reverse reads. And this is one of the things that's great about Galaxy and I promise not to do a comparison to command line. But one of the things potentially that can trip you up if you're writing this out in command line syntax, Galaxy has very nicely told me that it can set two inputs at this step. It will confuse the tool and throw an error. And this should throw an error to me personally as redesigning or extracting this work from the paper. So what do I need to think about? Well, I need to think about that Bowtie 2 was expecting single end and I needed to default it back paired end. You saw quite wonderfully there that the forward reads were still mapped. The reference was still mapped. We just now have a new option or the reverse reads. So there is the uh, core of a workflow 
uh, as described here in this particular paper. Alignments were then used to do additional things related to the annotation. So essentially we have in a very uh, succinct manner replicated the workflow for these two paragraphs of information here. As I said, you would need to go back in and confirm the tool settings were appropriate and replicated what's in the paper. And the final thing we need to do, uh, or, yes, need to do, is we need to give this workflow some inputs. So we have our trimmatic, we have our trinity, we have our bow tie. Let's fairly quickly add and one input data set, let's add another input data set. And again, as a feature of Galaxy I quite like, I can label this data set. And this is labeling for uh, that transparency and reproducibility. If I wanna share this workflow with someone, moving back to the primary authors of the paper to say, hey, did I get it right? And um, I loved your work, can I repeat it? I might well call it this forward reads. Uh, and by extension, I am going to call this reverse reads. As I do that, it changes on my screen. And these are not only mental cues, these will become physical cues inside uh, the workflow when you run it. So now we have told Galaxy where to source its reads, how to process them in Trimomatic, how to subsequently process da that data in Trinity, at the same time, send that data to Bowtie 2. Now, for those of you that are jumping ahead in your logic, uh, Bowtie 2 will sit in a paused state, a queued state on Galaxy, waiting for the Trinity result to finish because the Trinity result, oh, sorry, the Bowtie is conditional on the Trinity. So this won't make anything. Galaxy has a sophisticated scheduling system and uh, Bowtie 2 will only run when Trinity is finished. I'm going to save this workflow and I'm just going to show you what it looks like now when you run a workflow. So when you run your workflow, you're going to run it. Um, and again, I'm, I'm rushing you through a crash course in Galaxy. You're going to run it on the most recent history you have available. Not surprisingly for this webinar, the most recent history I have available is one that is ready for this workflow. Forward reads, reverse reads. So there is my uh, pre-prepared mental jog of what to put into this input and what to put into this input. I just need to change this one to forward, this to reverse. I have the opportunity to configure Trimomatic on the fly if I need to. I have the opportunity to configure Trinity. I don't need to do any of those things because I've done in the real world, the pre-investment in my thinking about how those tools are set up. And I would simply now hit run. Now I am going to hit run, but then we're going to switch to a different activity. Uh, I can send this to a new history in Galaxy, which is a way of uh, keeping each of your analyses um, separate if that is a value. Run workflow. Galaxy will invoke that workflow. It will tell me particular jobs are scheduled. I can check the inputs. I can check the steps I've set up and I can check the progress. And away we go. There it is there. We have created a workflow based on a publication. We've replicated it inside Galaxy and we're testing it for the first time. I have not in the opportunity here had an a chance to upsell, uh, renaming all the tools, renaming the outputs and tasks. There's a lot of power that one can have inside Galaxy to operate your workflows. The last thing I wanna do just briefly before we move on and to make sure the seminar, the webinar is to time. Here is the workflow in my workflow menu. I can do a number of things with it. I can now share it with Johan uh, to say, hey, I made it, it looks great export it for my own archive purpose, download it, uh, or I might need to iterate it for some quality so I can come back in and edit it. You can now see we do actually have a second version. So we had our initial version, which is very bland because it was empty. We have our second version that has the five steps. 
listed here on the screen. And then if we were to modify this, uh, say with some fast QC results, then we would get version three. Okay, so I promised to uh, show you a few things. And there you go, one of them has just been shown here. Galaxy will somewhat facetiously remind you always to save your work, which is a great cue. In this case, I do know I've done nothing, so I'm going to leave that workflow, but it's a fantastic reminder all the time. So Johan mentioned one of the ways um, one might create a workflow in Galaxy. And we don't have the luxury of finding a paper. Sometimes, to be honest, our analytical journey is a journey of discovery. And that's what the next two histories I'm going to show you present. So this first history here represents a two sets of data that I have. They are paired in data, but for, the, for this particular exercise, that doesn't matter. Uh, I have discovered them in an online repository and I want to ask a reasonable question. Uh, are they good quality for me to go on and investigate in my analysis? Uh, how might I do that? And two tools I know well in uh, fast QC, for fast quality control, and a tool called multi QC that aggregates those results. So this is on two files. I'm about to show you in a minute something on more files, but it can be challenging for me to absorb all these results and I'm not showing them in particularly good fashion. Um, and then come and compare it to this particular result here. Try and think about what I just saw. If I can type all this into multi QC, then I get the opportunity to see all my results in one. And I, I pause and reflect and think, wow, you know what? This would be really useful for me to run over and over again. The Galaxy has kept a record of everything I have done. Uh, in my history here, and I can, through the history options menu, do a function called extract workflow. When I do this, and I'll just shrink down the right hand side here, uh, Galaxy is going to create a workflow named based on the history name, and it's going to put back to me a number of things that it, think I, it thinks I did. So it tells me it fetched some data. Well, that's true. We need some inputs. It ran QC twice on two pieces of data and it put those into multi QC. It does say, would I like to treat this input data as the particular file name? I'm going to say, no, I want this to be forward reads and this to be reverse reads. And once I do this in my workflow, uh, presented with a fairly bland page where you can edit or run. Um, if I've encouraged you enough today and you know as well to use workflows, I would say don't ever just run a workflow, always have a bit of a look at it. Uh, it's very good practice to know what you're doing before you execute it. And here's our workflow. Forward reads, reverse reads, piped into fast QC, piped into fast QC, and the results therein piped into multi-QC. You will note that Galaxy has piped the right of the correct of the two outputs for this tool. And it is actually pre-configured multi-QC for the right output because that's everything I needed to do individually when I discovered and, and more organically iterated through my data set. So now there's a workflow that I have potentially arrived at uh, through inspiration by a paper, watching a tutorial or uh, a very organic exploration through your data. And you can capture that as a workflow. In the interest of time, I'm just going to show a bit quicker the next two features of um, Lexi workflows. So I want to show essentially the exact same workflow as I did then, um, but convince you that in many cases, you don't necessarily have just two files. And the beauty of a workflow is it can run on many files. So this particular history represents a history where I have a collection of 10 sets of paired data or 20 fast queue files. I went to the uh, a very easy effort in Galaxy of, of summarizing these as a collection. And it, that's what it says, a list of 20 data sets. 
And I did essentially exactly the same. I ran fast Q on the collection and I ran multi QC on the results of the fast Q. So I can do this again and extract my workflow. Now this extraction, I'm going to show you deliberately because it looks at first a little bit messy. It looks messy because Galaxy is, as I said earlier, very fastidious about cataloging information. And the first thing it tells me is that I imported 20 files. Well, I don't actually need those 20 uh, captured in my workflow. I expect my workflow to start from a collection. And that's a decision I've made. I'm going to uncheck all the elements of this workflow. Simply say, please start at a collection. Please include the fast QC. Please include the multi QC. And this could be paired read collection. It is anything to jog you about how to use the flow when you come across it again. Creating my workflow now. Just waiting for Galaxy, of course. Here we go. We'll arrive at that edit or run screen. I'll edit so you can see the results of this workflow creation. And here it is now. Data collection, fast QC, multi QC, and the descriptor of the noodles has changed slightly. This exploded noodle is to represent that you're piping multiple files in the state of a collection from an import through a tool. Fast QC recognizes this as a collection, but actually multi QC is built to take a collection and, and collapse it into a single uh, HTML page. So this is actually the reverse now that collection has been collapsed into multi QC. Uh, uh, I did say I would show you what a blank canvas looks like, and I'm going to rather ruthlessly do that here on the screen uh, by clearing that. Um, I think we've probably seen enough of this already. We could have simply come to any tool, but let's pick on one that we used before, Bowtie 2. And you're simply mapping this to here. You could, as I said, change it to pens. You could multiple sample there, which would be a bit weird. You probably would more appropriately clear that connection, bring another in. And this really is as easy as it is to create a workflow. As long as you're listening and aware of the things on the screen, like orange lines and red dots that should trigger you to say, Galaxy doesn't understand this, please think about it. You can figure the tool here on the right-hand side of your screen, you can figure it once and use it many times. Okay, I am going to jump back to the slides um, to summarize some of this work uh, before we wrap up the webinar. So um, some suggestions based hopefully on convincing you that workflows in Galaxy are fantastic. I did promise uh, that we would look about a number of these features. So there is a feature in that workflow menu uh, to invoke uh, a check of best practices and it will alert you if you have not completed an annotation for the workflow, cited a creator name, specified a license, configured your tools and added output labels. And please encourage use this as much as possible. Um, it makes your workflow significantly more reusable by yourself or shareable to anyone else. Because one of the natural points for workflows is to socialize them. And Galaxy allows you to publish your workflow to the shared history element of Galaxy. And these ones at the top, even though you can't read the name of the workflow, you can see they're all very well annotated relative to these down here. They have output labels and tags, and this allows you to much easily build confidence in the workflow and understand what it's going to do and uh, its value. Once you've done that, and once you have your Galaxy workflow, obviously an interest that Johan and I have to in the communities of um, workflow utilization and Galaxy is to, again, socialize or register your workflow and Workflow Hub would be our destination of choice. 
you are um, going through to register yourself, register your organization, and then register your workflow. Having done it and having worked your time on this, the process is very seamless. Um, and the end result, uh, without grandiising, is you can reference your workflow. So this is one that Johan and myself have worked on uh, to take uh, remove duplicates from genome assemblies. And we're able to mint a DOI of uh, this workflow and now use that as the shareable entity for the workflow. And with that, um, workers are part of sharing. They're ju not just for you. I think I've said that enough in the last few minutes. So we really want to talk about staying connected through communities uh, that who uh, are notable communities to talk about here. There's the Galaxy community, uh, which is a global community of Galaxy practitioners, not just coders, but users of Galaxy. So Galaxy for scientists, trainers, tool authors, developers, and admins. And there's also the bioinformatics workflow community built and hosted and, and fostered by the Australian Biocommons and web links for both of those at the bottom. And with that, um, thank you. We've listed a couple of emails, Johan's email, and you can get me or the greater uh, Galaxy Australia team, which I should thank for all the fantastic work they do to make this available, which is help at genome.edu.au. I think with that, Liz, I am throwing back to you. Thanks so much, Gareth and Johan. That was a great whistle stop tour of workflows in Galaxy. We do have time for questions now. If you have a question for Gareth or Johan, please write that into the Q&A box and we'll read them out and try to answer them for you. I'm going to start off with a question of my own, if that's all right. Um, I think you mentioned at the beginning that there are 300 or so public Galaxy workflows. Where can you find those and what kind of topics do they cover? I, thank you. I'm happy to take that one. I thought you were going to ask your hand to list all 300 workflow languages, which I thought maybe is a little under. We might be here a little while yeah. if we do that. <laughs> um, so uh, Galaxy Australia, as it loads, has this shared data section that can be found on top of the screen. Uh, we have a number of things, and sorry, I won't get too tangential. You are asking specifically about the workflows, uh, and they are hosted here in the middle panel. The workflows I would like to draw people's attention to um, are those that we, we screen grabbed for the talk, and they're listed up here. But also we post all the workflows for the Galaxy Training Network, uh, which is a fantastic resource of hundreds of tutorials uh, to allow you to learn to do the science and we host the workflows for those as well. Thanks for all that. Thanks, Gareth. Sorry, just lost my Zoom window there for a second. I'm really glad you mentioned the Galaxy Training Network though. I did want to highlight that to people. It, as Gareth said, it's a fantastic collection of tutorials on how to do just about every type of biological data analysis you can think of and using established methods and workflows as well. So that's a really good, another really good place to start if you're looking for workflows to use. We had a question in the Q&A box during the session, which was about, can you publish your Galaxy workflows with a DOI? Uh, it looks as though you sort of showed that at the end. So it seems that uh, Galaxy itself doesn't give you a DOI, but then if you register it in Workflow Hub, you can get a DOI. Is, is that how that works? Yes, but Johan, did you want to expand on that? Uh, I mean, I, I think, uh... I think what you showed during the webinar, Gareth, like just demonstrates like the, that, that function quite clearly. Um, the registries are a, a single place um, where you can register something, where you can mint a DOI and where you can make things more findable. Um, and um, in, in the case of Workflow Hub, that's just an inbuilt function. So you click a button, you request a DOI and it gets minted. Fantastic, thank you. 
And a good thing to remember for everyone, if you are reusing someone else's workflow, do cite it because then they get the recognition back for developing that workflow as well. A question that's just come in in the Q&A box is, is it possible to convert Docker pipelines to Galaxy workflows? Yes, Let, let's say that with more confidence. Uh, yes, Melissa, um, <laughs> thank you for the questions. Um, practically, uh, I guess there's two levels to that answer. One, we would uh, advocate you do it similar to the from a publication process that we showed. Two, Galaxy Project is actively working on translation tools, uh, as is the Australian Biocommons, to take one workflow language and allow you to translate it into another. So uh, stay tuned for some of that activity. Uh, if not, in the meantime, it is more of a manual translation. Thank you. So I think a question that might come up for many people is, um, where can they store their data and their workflows and how long is that stored for? Are there steps that they need to take in order to sort of safeguard their data and their workflows over time? Yep, that's a, an excellent question. Um, and there's a two-part answer to it from um, Galaxy's basis, and I'll try to answer it on behalf of Galaxy. So uh, storing workflows, uh, at this point in time, all the major Galaxy servers store those uh, in perpetuity uh, for anyone that has them. Uh, this is really a technical function. They're relatively small their minimal cost to, to host long-term. Research as data, uh, each of the Galaxy services takes a slightly different approach to this. And uh, within Galaxy Australia, we have data uh, for a full calendar year beyond when you stop accessing it. So if it's a live data, a live history, you can access it for many years. If you have published on it, forgotten about it, it was a play history, then after 365 days, we will purge it. And we do strongly recommend that our researchers archive that back to their institutional storage, um, uh, if not their personal storage. So yeah, each of the Galaxy servers does handle that slightly differently. Thanks, Gareth. Uh, one last question for today is, if people need help in developing their workflows, where can they find that help and who should they get in touch with? <laughs> That's a, yeah, a good question. Uh, I would say in the first instance, um, please do use the help at genome.edu.au uh, account for Galaxy Australia. Uh, so that is not just for Galaxy Australia. We do want to foster good open science globally. Uh, however, behind Galaxy Australia or complementing it is the global Gitter channel, which is a chat channel for galaxies worldwide. Uh, that can be found on that Galaxy Community Hub page that we showed on the last slides. And that's also a fantastic resource to, to post your open questions and, and get support on building your workflow. Johan, do you have anything that you'd like to add there? Um, I think the... Probably the best option, just because of the breadth and depth of bioinformatics, is to actually get involved with one of the communities. So Gal uh, Gareth has already mentioned a few of them in the Galaxy context, and on one of the slides we have a link to the bioinformatics workflows community. Uh, so th those are really good forums to find people who are working on similar things um, to you if, you if you actually need assistance. Um, but it's also a good idea just to see what others have developed already right so you can go to the registries you can go to the galaxy um, shared workflows um, and that's a really good place to learn from what others have done before well, as we might say sharing is caring and the more we can work together as a community the more we will be able to achieve well, we are going to leave it there for today. Thank you so much, Gareth and Johan, for joining us and sharing a little bit of insight into how you can use Galaxy for workflows. I have a couple of things to share with you as we wrap up, so just bear with me a moment. So coming up next webinar is next Friday, and we have a guest joining us from the US, and we're taking a little 
detour from biothematics specifically, and we're going to look at the idea of effective, inclusive, and scalable training in the life sciences and the things that you can do to make that happen. The details on that webinar are up on the Biocommons website, along with details of other events as well. So thank you once again to Johan and Gareth, and thank you to all of you for joining us as well. Uh, as we leave, I'd just like to acknowledge the funding that we have. The Australian Biocommons is enabled by ANCRIS via Bioplatforms Australia funding, and Galaxy Australia is supported by funding from the Queensland Government's Research Infrastructure Co-Investment Fund, Bioplatforms Australia and the ARDC, both of which are supported by ANCRIS. So thanks again for joining us. We hope that you enjoyed the webinar and we hope to see you again soon. Until then, enjoy your day and goodbye for now.